Wellspring Ministries presents Streams in the Desert, hosted by Pastors George and Sharon Stover. This dynamic Las Vegas couple bring the life-changing Word of God alive through the anointed prophetic ministry. Their teaching causes mountain-moving faith to bring the victory of God's love to bear on the everyday issues of life. Join George and Sharon now as they share with you the secrets and the joys of a fulfilling and abundant Spirit-filled and Spirit-led life. Well, it's my distinct opportunity tonight to talk to you about your dreams. <laughs> what a surprise. Uh, what a surprise. <laughs> we, we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks. And how uh, God gives a dream, and uh, when he gives a dream, then there comes those that want to steal the dream. And we talked about friends and family and time and circumstances and all of these things coming in and trying to steal the dream. It either takes too long or uh, somebody rains on your parade and you get discouraged and it becomes a, a challenge to follow the Lord. And following the Lord is not an exact science. So therefore, we can miss some turns along the way, can't we? We can, we can kind of uh, blow it. But you were born to be remarkable in the kingdom of God, and there's nobody like you. Nobody like you. What has he got up there? Oh, yes, I cheated on my fears, broke up with my doubts, got engaged in my faith, and now, what's the bottom say? Marrying my dream. Yay, we're marrying our dream. So, I mean, you are the only one of you on the face of the earth. To think about that, it's pretty awesome. I think it's great. We kind of discount ourselves as just being us, but God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. And you're unique. There's nobody that's like you. So you're really like one of a kind in the kingdom. And that should encourage you because you don't have to be like someone else. You don't have to carry out somebody else's dream. You don't have to take somebody else's dream as your own. You can have your own dream from God, and he has a destiny for each one of us. Amen. So we've been talking about that and talking about uh, Hebrews 10.23. And if you would turn there, Hebrews 10.23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Hebrews 10.23. The Amplified says, So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish, and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, sure, and faithful to his word. So what do we do? Do we take our dream and fulfill it ourselves, or do we trust in the God who gave the dream and know that he's faithful and he's going to fulfill it for us Amen. and in us? Amen. And so that's, that's an important thing because I've seen a lot of people think they have something, and then they go for it in their own flesh, in their own strength. And it doesn't work out. I mean, it becomes very destructive in their lives. And unfortunately, other people watch them, and they think, if this is the way God works, then I don't really want to follow any dreams from God because I might make a mistake. I might be embarrassed. I mean, it might not work like I think it's going to work. Well, what I've found is that over the years, it never think works like you think it's going to work. Never. It never works like you think it's going to work. You just think you think you know how it's going to work, but we don't know how it's going to work. In fact, we are surprised, and that's a good thing. When God brings things to pass, we should be surprised. Amen. And so the Greek word, and this is kind of reiterating what I talked about last week, but the Greek word for profession is homologia, which means of 
of the same kind, words of the same kind. So if we're going to hold fast the profession of our faith, then we're going to agree with the Word of God. Amen. It's going to agree with the Word. And you say, well, I don't see it in the Word. Well, you probably just don't know what you're looking at because uh, there are scriptures that says, go ye into all the world. You can start there, and it will multiply from there. Everybody has a dream from God because he has a destiny for each one of us. And so we, uh, we speak words of the same kind. We hold fast the profession of our faith. We speak words of the same kind as God speaks. And it's more than just repeating. I mean, we could all open the book and read something and repeat it and repeat it. But if it's not in your heart, it isn't got life. And that's the key. Some people think that, well, we'll just say it. But somewhere it has to transfer from the written page to the rima or the life of God in our hearts and in our life. So we, we are going to solidify what, what we think that God wants us to do. And we don't have to run away from church to do that. We don't have to run away from people to do that. It's better to stay in a place where everybody loves you because then if you make a mistake, they'll help you. Amen? Amen? It's not like when you went off to school and it, even the teacher wanted you to fail because somehow it looked better for her that way or him. I mean, I was classes like that. But in the church, everybody wants, should want you to succeed because your success is the success of the church, which means it furthers the kingdom of God. And sometimes we get discouraged because it doesn't happen fast enough. We get discouraged because it doesn't happen the way we want it to happen. And so we say, well, we'll go somewhere else and it'll happen there. And that's uh, kind of like um, changing your geographic location every time you don't like what's going on in your life. The challenge is you take yourself with you. So wherever you go, you're going to have the same problem because it's you. Robbie says, it's you. You're the issue. It's you. That's it. It's you. <laughs> so you take yourself with you. And so that's something for us to remember. But when we, when we get into divine alignment or we get into agreement with God, there is more to it than just saying something. Our profession or confession of faith is more than just being a parrot and just repeating something mindlessly. We don't chant, we don't do mantras in the kingdom of God. What we do is we speak the word of God in faith as it comes out of our heart. And it has to get into our heart. How does it get there? Well, it gets there by repetitive planting. Then correct me if I'm wrong. But I'll slap you if you tell me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but it is, it's repetitive. So that's why we encourage you to read your Bible. To read your Bible because it will strengthen you and it will begin to bring together those parts and pieces of your destiny in your in your heart in your spirit to where you know what you know and you then can begin to recognize when there's open doors we can recognize when this is beginning to come to pass and you can move with God and that really is a key that's really a key that we have to be able to recognize that this is where I'm going. Amen. Because if we don't recognize it, we will miss where we're going. We'll miss the signs. You would have never been in the British Isles if you hadn't gone with the vision. And you could have missed the ferry boat many times, right? Could have missed the plane, could have missed the boat. Well, we can all do that. But it's important for us to recognize we need to agree with God. And it doesn't, I, mean, I don't, dreams of, of, of ministry, that's one thing. That's a dream of service. We're going to serve God in any way we want to. The thing is that we think we're going to be this when God is really calling us to do this. This is what fulfills us, but we think because other people do it this way, we should do it that way. And we have to begin to realize that we're not carbon copies of anybody else. Amen. I mean, we, we have something unique to offer to the body of Christ. And so we grow up, we learn the word, 
we, we get into fellowship, we get into communion with one another, and then we began to work at what God has called us to do. And you don't always start at the top. Did you ever notice that? So interesting. People today, in their 20s, they get married or they get together. I wish they'd get married. but And they think they should start where their parents left off. Or well, they don't recognize that it may have taken them 50 years to get where they were. And it doesn't happen instantly when you're 20. I hate to tell you where Pastor and I started out. Oh, my goodness, in a, in a trailer in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, with him in the military, and me unable to work because I wasn't licensed in that state yet. And uh, it was a poor, bad time, a bad, poor time. We were very poor, very poor. Coal, oil, heat in the trailer. I mean, it was, it was difficult. I went in there weighing 120, came out weighing 105. It was worse for him, though. He went in there weighing 210 and came out at 165. Uh, we worked him hard. <laughs> that was the first time in my life I ever went to bed hungry multiple times. But our dream was to be together. We were in love. We couldn't wait for him to get out of the military. So we suffered together. But it bonded us together. And we said, well, since we started here, we can't go any, dope, any lower. So everything here is from up. It's got to go up, right? And it did. Everything went up from there. Because if you're there, you can't go much lower. So your dream doesn't always start where you think you're going to finish. And it's important for us to realize that. Remember the story I told you about Joseph? When he was going through Potiphar's house, the prison house, the butcher or the baker and the and the and the cupbearer when he had those things in going on years went by years went by and psalm says that that's where he became the man that could run the country Amen. he wasn't the man that could run the country when he got thrown in the water pit by his brothers he was just a young man he didn't have any experience or he'd have been more leery of his brothers wouldn't he but all of those things built him through trials, through tribulations, through confusing situations, through things that happened. He didn't lose sight of the God he served. Amen. And I think that is really the key for us, is we must keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amos 3.3 says, Can two walk together except they be agreed? And so... If we're going to walk with God, we have to agree with him in our heart, not just with our mouth or not just in our mind, not just mental assent. We've, not, we've got to begin to, to agree with him in our heart. I mean, what he says is what we're going to do because we believe it. If he says don't lie, we're going to quit lying. That will align us with God. If he says don't fornicate, we're going to quit fornicating. Not that any of you would do that. But I'm just saying, there are things that change in our life because we want to agree with God. God says, be holy as I am holy. And so that constrains us, doesn't it, to look at our behavior, look at the way we're living, look at what we're thinking, look at what we're feeding our minds, what we're doing. If we want to align ourselves with God, then we need, we're going to probably need to make some changes, aren't we? I know when I first read the Bible when I was <laughs> first born again and it said that liars had their place in the lake of fire, my picture in my mind was water skiing on the lake of fire. <laughs> and I thought, that doesn't look like a good deal because I wasn't a good water skier and I would have probably fallen in the flames. So what did I have to do not to go there? I had to quit lying. Pastor, you are a liar. Well, you're all liars before you're born again. In fact, you still lie after you're born again sometimes. Yeah, I mean, really. Somewhere we got to come into the point that if God's word says don't lie, then we agree with that. And I went, the lake of fire helped me agree with it. Yeah. It gave me a, a, a reason to agree with it, right? I was like, okay, I better quit lying and I better start telling the truth. Then it is, what's the truth? 
And how do you say the truth nicely? That's always the key, isn't it? How do you say the truth nicely? Luckily, I, I met some people who were able to tell the truth nicely. And I kind of saw it was possible. So you begin to learn how to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. And so we've got these changes. How can two walk together except they be agreed? So uh, not to, to linger on this, but, but it's, it's something where we've got to get it in our heart, what God says, and know him, to where we're not like the man with the talents who hid his talents in the ground. And then when the master came back and everybody gave their accounting, he said, I hid mine in the ground because I knew you were not a nice man. And you were a cheater. And you made your money the wrong way. And he blamed it all on the master because he didn't do something that he was told to do. And uh, he didn't know the master, did he? He had no idea the character of the master. He had no idea the heart of the master. He had no idea what the master was thinking. Why did he give them a talent to do business with while he was gone? What kind of a master was that? And so we can see that there's got to be some kind of adjustment in our thinking. I mean, if God gives us a vision, a dream, it will be doable. It will be doable. But it will be doable in due season, I think. Yes. It will be doable when we're ready to do it. We have some people down at the Revival Center, and pastor has been teaching them to, in leadership class. And, and he started to uh, teach them to maybe um, give a little Bible study. And so when they, <clears throat> uh, before that, oh, they just, well, I'm going to be a preacher. I want to preach the word. I'm going to be a teacher. They were all puffed up and full of themselves until he said, okay, take this verse and, and give me five minutes on this. And they went, they got terrified. There's more to it. There's more to it. And there's more to it because it's not a thing to feed your ego. It's a thing to feed the sheep. Amen. And so then we learn through those experiences, don't we? They're going to be built up. They're going to be taught. They're going to learn. They're going to have time to practice. And by the time they get practiced up and they have a few... Hmm, what would you say? Um, water pits. They might have a few slave trains taking them off, getting off track. They might have a few false accusations like Joseph did, right? They might have people that don't appreciate their gift at all. Somebody might laugh at them. But it teaches you and strengthens you and makes your relationship with God to where you're doing this for the Lord. You're not doing it to, to impress people. You're not doing it to, I mean, I'd like people to receive the lesson I'm going to teach. But if you don't, I'm going to do the very best I can. But you can walk out with nothing. With the best preacher in the world, you can walk out with nothing. So it doesn't, it's a matter of your heart and your reception for what God is speaking to you. So we don't want to be idly just speaking things. We want to confess things through a heart that's got the power of God in it. And we talked last week about your dreams being, being uh, postponed. And, and I want to tell you something. They're postponed to build you. And in the midst of the time they're postponed, God will work in you. Uh, a question, are you pliable in God's hands? Do you have your mind made up? Or are you willing to be shaped and then reshaped and then broken and reshaped again? Sometimes we need to get broken to get the vision. Because what we saw was not the vision. So it's, look at Jeremiah 18.6 and let's see what he says. Jeremiah 18, 6. 
Well, Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. This is giving a little background. And the potter was working at the wheel, and the vessel he was making from the clay was spoiled in the hand of the potter. So he made it over, reworking it into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make it. And the word of the Lord, then Jeremiah says, came to me, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as the potter does? Says the Lord, Below as the, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now, I don't know if you've ever watched anybody work clay, but to me, working clay, I'd love to do it, but it's messy. And it's violent. Because clay is full of air bubbles. And if you take a clay pot, or you make a pot out of clay and it has air bubbles in it, when you put it in the kiln, it will explode because the air expands in the heat. And so you'll see a potter will take a lump of clay and he has a wire like you would grunt people, <laughs> strangle them, like a piano wire or just a wire. And he, he cuts that, he cuts that thing and he cuts it with this wire all the way through and all the way up and down and he pounds on it and he throws it on the ground, he beats on it. He throws it down, and then he begins to put it on the wheel. And then he may go along, and he may, as he's shaping it, he may find a bubble. He may take the whole thing off and beat it again. This is the way the potter works. When John says he's going to make you a clay vessel, you're going to have a few bumps, aren't you? He's going to get the hot air out of you. <laughs> He's going to use that, that wire. He's going to shorten you up a little bit, build you up, strengthen you, because the clay gets stronger the more dense it is without the air bubbles in it. Amen. And so he begins to work that vessel. And then if it's marred in his hand, he will start over again. Now, you may say that's horrible, but to me that's good news. God is never not going to start over with you if you need to start over. He's always going to start over. If something is not quite right, he is going to start over. And he will begin to work with you. Look at Isaiah uh, 29, 16. Isaiah 29, 16. Here again he says, you turn things upside down. You are perverse. Shall the potter be considered of no more account than the clay? Shall the thing that is made say of its maker, he did not make me? Or the thing that is formed say of him who formed it, he has no understanding? Well, that's because we would like to be a tall, slender pot. I always wanted to be taller than I am. The only way I would get that way is they put me in a rack and stretch me out. We always want to be what we're not. Yeah. We either want to be shaped this way or we want to be shaped that way. We want to look this way. We want to look that way. And what are we saying? The potter made a mistake in the first place because we don't like the product. <laughs> and we are the product. Because if God molds us and he's fixing us and he's shaping us, then... Has he not more vision of what he sees us becoming than what we see ourselves in our vain imaginings wanting to be? And we may hinder ourselves that way. If we see ourselves one way and God is making us this way, we may resist. We may not be happy we have a bubble over here and he wants to get it out. You know, sometimes you can rub the bubbles out and they'll, they'll be all right, but you may try to rub that bubble out and it goes clear through the jar, the pot. Then you've got to start over because there's a flaw. There's a basic flaw. And so to align us with his purpose and his, his uh, principles and his character, he is going to have to fashion us and rework us, maybe more than once. Isaiah 64, 8. Yet, O oh Lord, you are our Father, we are the clay, and you are the potter, and we are all the work of your hand. We're all the work of your hand. 
who do we belong to? Romans 9.20. But who are you, mere man, to criticize and contradict and answer back to God? Will what is formed say to him that formed it, why have you made me this way? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same mass, the same lump, one vessel for beauty and distinction and honorable use, and another for menial or ignoble or dishonorable use? What if God, although fully intending to show the awfulness of his wrath and to make known his power and authority, has tolerated with much patience the vessels, the objects of his anger, which are ripe for destruction, and what if he thus purposes to make known and show the wealth of his glory in dealing with the vessels, objects of his mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory? God has a plan. He's got a plan. And because he has a plan, he's going to make us according to his plan. And you can, you can reassure yourself because every morning the sun comes up, every night the sun goes down. The planets are still in their place, aren't they? And they've been there since he created everything out of nothing. They've been there that way. And our life is how short compared to that? Can't he get it right? Of course he can. He's got us in his hand. There's nothing, I mean, I really believe that as we follow God, there's nothing, I mean, we can walk away from God, we can sin, we can do evil things. We have the right to do that. He didn't build robots. He didn't make us to do things that we didn't want to do. But when our want to's line up with Him, when our plans and purposes line up with the plan and purpose of God, then we find ourselves being fashioned into the vessel that God made us to be, Amen. that he wants us to be. One more scripture in Isaiah 45, 9. Woe to him who strives with his maker, a worthless piece of broken pottery among other pieces equally worthless, and yet presuming to strive with his maker. Shall the clay say to him who fashions it, What do you think you're making? Or your work has no handles? Haven't you ever done that with God? I don't know. I thought my ears were too big. I was too short. I mean, we all see ourselves in different ways, don't we? And yet we've got to recognize that God knew us in the womb before we were ever born and he, we were fashioned there in secret in the dark place intricately woven and so those are the ears I'm supposed to have I have to be careful in a windstorm but it's all right <laughs> I'm just kidding but I mean actually we have to come to a point in ourselves that we're okay with ourselves because this is the way God made us. And we're okay with ourselves. Because a lot of our resistance to God is the fact that we look at ourselves and we say, you didn't make us good enough to fulfill your destiny. Because I don't do this as well as so-and-so, and I don't do that as well as that person, and I don't look like that person, and I'm not as tall as that person, or I'm not as smart. What well, You don't know what you are because you haven't become what you're going to be. So we just need to follow on to know him and not resist the potter's wheel, not resist it. And then another thing that God does to bring us into his alignment is he'll prune us. So we have a potter on one example. The other side is a pruner. Well, now you know it's, it's spring and everything's. If you have a yard or you have bushes or trees or whatever, you look around, you can see there needs to be some pruning done. And we're not just pruning dead branches. I have a lot of trees out here. And I mean, it's overwhelming to look at those trees and see what they've done to themselves. But they got too many branches over here and not enough branches over there. 
and they got all these suckers at the bottom and the rose bushes are growing and they haven't been pruned yet. And I mean, there's just, that which is productive still gets pruned. You don't have to be dead to be pruned and cut off. Yes, we do cut off dead branches and dead things, but you prune and shape so it will be more prolific as it comes to full maturity. And that's what God does with us. Amen. Uh, John 15, 1 through 9. Now, these things are not meant to kill us. These things are meant to perfect us, to make us more productive, to make us look like what God has when he looks at us. He's got a picture of us. And we're fulfilling our destiny. And we are not wanting. We are not uh, unable. We are not uh, too weak because he said we can do what all things in Christ. So we can do it. Well, I never did that in my life. Well, there's always a first time, isn't there? Amen. But we can let those things steal our dream. We can let all of those thoughts, all of those things, everything people have said to us that's negative, we can have that to steal our dream. And sometimes we can have what they said to us positive steal our dream also. I mean, somebody must have told you you were going to be a rock star. And God doesn't have that in mind for you. He wants you to do something different. And if it isn't a rock star, you ain't going to do it. And then what do you do? You begin to resist the will of God for your life. It's interesting, isn't it? Because things come into our brain all through our life. We gather information, and that information can stop us from fulfilling what God has for us and steal our dream. But you may have to die to your dream. You might have to die to your dream. Amen. Because resurrection brings life. Resurrection brings life. And we've seen that so much, and, and uh, Marty and Sharon can agree with that. We've seen that so much with, with musicians who come in from playing in the world, get born again, and they just want to play in the church just like they played in the world. But the church don't play like they played in the world. Because there's something called the anointing, the alignment with God, to where we get into the flow of God. The most simple things can be the most moving things. It doesn't matter if you have 15 chord progressions. In the world, everybody will scream and holler. But in the church, if there's no anointing, it's nothing. It just means nothing. So we have to die to that. You have to die to that talent of yourself and begin to follow the Holy Spirit in whatever you do, whether it's music or, or whether it's anything. And so it's something to consider. John 15, 1 through 9, Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the dry vine dresser. And any branch in me that does not bear fruit, he cuts away, trims, and takes away. Yeah, I can agree with this. When I prune, I want the dead wood off. Yep, the winds blow, the branch cracks, the, it dies, so you want the dead wood off. And, uh, but then he says he cleans, he cleanses and repeatedly prunes every branch that continues to bear fruit. So he's going to prune the good branches also. So you find yourself being fruitful. We think, I'm going to escape pruning this year. I've been doing everything so good. But no, we're going to get pruned because he wants to make bear more and richer and more excellent fruit. And then the word, verse 3 says, the word, he says, the word that I've given you has already cleansed and pruned you already. Amen. If you don't read the word, you don't get cleansed and pruned. You don't come upon the scripture that speaks to your heart and says, you got to quit lying, Sharon. Okay, quit lying. No like a fire for me. I mean, seriously. So this word needs to begin to affect us that we begin to move in and agree with God. 
But we've got to trust him. We have to trust him. Amen. Faith is trusting God. It's just, it is trusting God. I mean, I find it interesting that we can get on an airplane and trust a pilot we've never seen with our life in a tin can and think we're going to fly 14 and a half hours to Israel. To me, that's insanity. I don't know his, I don't know the pilot. I don't know his record. I don't know how old he is. I don't know if he has heart trouble. You understand what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know how old the plane is. I don't even know how much gas goes in it. It's a lot. I mean, that's crazy, isn't it? But we can't trust God? The ruler and the maker of all that is? The, the one that saved our soul, we believe him. Oh, we're going to go to heaven. Why can't we trust him to prune us? Why can't we trust him to rearrange our attitudes and rearrange our thoughts and rearrange our goals and our motives so they correspond with the word of God because it's the word that's going to cleanse you the washing of the water of the word of God and yet it is the hardest thing to get people to read the Bible Amen. it's terrible it's very hard and I can't figure that out except the mind of man is that enmity with the word of God so the mind of man resists it but where's the love for God and I know I'm talking to the choir here I mean you all read your Bible and, uh, but it's a battle. And people who don't read their Bible will fail because they'll never align themselves with God because they don't know what it says. They don't know what he's thinking because it's all in here. Amen. And, I mean, I agree that we don't understand every word of this. I mean, when I was, began reading the Bible when I was first born again, I was the, the week I got born again, I read the whole Bible once and the New Testament again through. I was a fast, I'm a fast reader, but that was extraordinary. I didn't do anything else, by the way, but, uh, but it changed me because I had something supernatural happen to me, and this was the only way I knew to find out what happened to me. And when I found out what happened to me, it began to change me. So it was in the reading of the Word that I really got grounded. And even then, uh, you grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord because you're going to fulfill what He has for you. And if you want to do that, this is the most important thing for you. Amen. Amen. So this is what's going to bring us into alignment with God. It's going to teach us not to hold grudges. It's going to teach us how to forgive. It's going to teach us not to be competitive. It's going to teach us not to get angry when somebody else gets elevated above us. It's going to teach us when somebody doesn't accept our great idea that, well, maybe they know something more than I know, right? Can we consider? If we don't like the way God made us, what did we just read a scripture? And he says, I mean, you're going to tell me? You don't like what you are? God is God. Yes, he's able to change us. But he will perfect us in whatever state he gets us in. And that's the beauty of the walk with the Lord. So we can't resist him. Can you think of what you're holding on to that might be hindering you from obtaining what you want most in life? I've been thinking about this the last few weeks, talking about dreams and, and fulfilling dreams and, and getting the dream back even though everybody seems to be against your dream or they're leaving you or they're saying bad things about you or any number of things can happen in your life to steal your dream. Somewhere we've got to see what is it and who gave it and who's the most important person here. And it's God. Because if God said it, he's going to bring it to pass. I mean, if he said it, and I recognize that sometimes we need to dig in a little bit deeper and reassure ourselves and reorient ourselves to who he is. Who is this God that we're serving? Because we can get very lackadaisical in our walk with God. We can get very lazy. 
Uh, sometimes we don't read our Bibles and, oh, well, I'll make it up, and then we're three months behind at the end of the year. Uh, that's not making it up. I found you really can't make it up, but you can sure read ahead. That's easier. If you read ahead, you have a little slack if you can't do one one day, right? It's much easier than catching up. And yet, that is what's going to change you. We're going to, we're vitally attached to him if he's the vine and we're the branches. We're vitally attached to him. And our destiny is vitally attached to him. We are in Christ. Yes, he comes to dwell in us, but when he comes to dwell in us, he has placed us in him. So we are in Christ. So who has given you what talent you have? The Lord has. Who's going to bring it to pass? Who makes sure you have a job? Who's trying to teach you if you don't have a job? Maybe you need an attitude adjustment so you can have a job. I know some people get jobs and then they just blow them off. You see what I'm saying, though? It all works in our life to bring us to the place that we can become who God says he wants us to be. So our best, our best move is to not let something hinder us. Let's let go of what's hindering us. Let's let go of it. It's not worth it. It's not worth it to hold a grudge. It's not worth it to hold unforgiveness. It's not worth it not to read our Bible. It's so much more worth it to read our Bible because then we'll know what's working within us. We say, well, I listen to people. Well, listening to people, if you haven't read this, you don't know what they're saying is right or not. Amen. You have no idea what they're saying is right or not. If it's not in here, it's not true. Basically, you say, well, you're too literal. Yeah, I am pretty literal with this, pretty literal. I wish I understood it better, but I know that it applies to every area of my life and of your life. And I just want you to be able to fulfill the dream that God has given you and uh, realize that sometimes you're going to get strengthened through the hard times. And I don't like hard times. I don't like it. No, I don't like it at all. But I've not been 14 years in the prison house, so... Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen, like Joseph was. I've not been stuck there. I have been falsely accused, but I'll tell you what, it didn't hurt me because I'm in Christ. So were they talking about me? No. They were talking about him because I'm walking with him. Amen? So don't let those things get to you. Realize that he loves you. He has a plan. He knows how to spin you on that wheel and make you look like the most beautiful vessel because it's beautiful to him. We are happy with how we are because he likes it. And I think that's where we have to come to. What is his dream for me? I'm going to be happy with what my, his dream for me is because that's what he chose me for. And that's a good thing. And I remember when, I, when the Lord called me and he told me out of John, just feed my sheep. So I've tried to do that for 40 years. Just feed my sheep. Feed the sheep. Baby the sheep. Quit feeding the goats. Just feed the sheep. Amen. It's not always been easy. Do you know what? It's been very rewarding. Praise the Lord. So God will bring you to a place, and he'll do it in you. Just believe him and let go of that which is hindering you. Your presupposed ideas, the things that you think you're going to be or you should be, I'll tell you what, what God has for you is bigger than anything you could ask or think. You wouldn't even believe it. Amen. Hallelujah. We don't have to wait to become like him. We press in to become like him. We get into his word. We take on the mind of Christ. We begin to speak the words of Christ. And we are to the earth 
like him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we can transform our community and transform our country and transform our world with the word of the living God when we speak what Jesus speaks. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm not waiting to be like him. I am becoming like him. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. in you the hope of glory <laughs> oh hallelujah 